Good afternoon. It looks like it's one o'clock uh, Eastern time, so I want to welcome everybody. Uh, respectful of your time, I just wanted to start on time. And uh, again, thank you for joining us for this webinar series uh, for LB Foster. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, some collaborative work we did with several consultants and contractors. And hopefully some of this will be of interest. And if there's any uh, questions, uh, I'll hopefully have time at the end to open up a uh, question and answer session. And if we do run out of time, I will have my contact information at the very end, at the end slide. And I uh, strongly recommend just email me and I will let definitely answer any questions that you might have uh, throughout this uh, presentation. So don't hesitate. I'd be happy to try to answer all your questions. And again, uh, you know, with, with all of this COVID life, sometimes uh, right here I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, and it's a little bit uh, cloudy out. But uh, in case I should have some issues with my connection, try joining back in and, and we'll see if we can make it work that way. But uh, I'm going to assume everybody's OK and I'm going to keep going forward. I uh, just wanted to again thank you everybody. I wanted to just share with you just some real brief overview. I'll cover basically uh, MSC walls, of course, but I wanted to also introduce you a little bit about steel sheet piling. Uh, a lot of times that that's really a subject that's not covered too much in uh, universities. Uh, I'm a structural engineer. I've, I've taken wood, concrete, steel, masonry, and uh, sheet piling is really one of those niche uh, kind of materials that isn't uh, touched upon too much. So I want to give you a little background about it first and then jump into some case studies and hopefully these will be of uh, interest. Again, my name is Richard Morales. I'm uh, the Director of Engineering for LB Foster and please uh, send me some questions and I and again, if I'll try to get to them at the end. So I'll, I'm going to be covering how they make uh, steel sheet piling. I'll also talk about some types of interlocks which are Real important, they're very unique, uh, especially to the PZC, it's, it's a ball and socket, so it's a unique interlock. And also talk about um, maybe some typical uses for sheet piling, such as coffer dams, but then really I'm gonna jump into the case studies. Just a little bit about uh, the company LB Foster. Uh, real briefly, it, it's uh, we've been around for over a hundred years. Uh, we've got sales, folks uh, from coast to coast. So if there's any particular area that you are located in, I'm sure we can find a salesperson that can help you. Um, I've, I personally have done work with the company as far north as Alaska and as far south as Peru. And uh, just recently, actually, we, uh, a few couple years back, we were really uh, excited because we had finished a job down in Panama Canal on the expansion. But anyway, just a uh, just a real quick uh, overview on the company, but uh, like I said, we've been around for a while. We, we're here to help you, and I think we can probably uh, collaborate with you and help you uh, come up with some ideas. Just a little bit about the steel. Uh, this is We provide domestic hot roll steel. This is uh, a, kind of exactly how you would see from that photo on the top left. You take a lot of old automobiles and old Maytag washers, and you, you basically are going to Take them to the mill. Uh, we use Gerdau uh, in two mills. They're both domestic. One is in Norfolk, Virginia, and another one is in Middle Othian, Texas. And uh, just as you would think, you take all that and you would melt it in these electric arc furnaces. And uh, part of that process is it comes out in this, what they call a dog bone. That dog bone is, uh, it looks like an H pile, looks like a wide flange. And uh, that dog bone comes out in that molten state and to imagine making that into a Z sheet pile or uh, a flat sheet, it really is not a trivial uh, thing. I mean, you've got to go through a whole series of rollers to to get that interlock and uh, that, that takes um, several iterations going back and forth, back and forth and uh, these mills have a whole bunch of stands with these different rollers and they create that interlock. And once that interlock is to the standards of ASTM A6, then uh, then you that's how you get that PZC or the PS flat sheets uh, that, that we provide. So PZC, uh, just a quick uh, history thing, that the way they got that name PZC was back in the old days with 
Bethlehem Steel, they had PZ. Some of the older folks in the audience may recall Bethlehem had uh, the, the workhorses of the day were the PZ. Well, uh, there was a company came in into a mini mill in, in Chaparral that was called Chaparral in Middle Othian, Texas, and they wanted to market. Uh, there's this new PZC. And because the company was called Chaparral, that's why they put the C at the end of it. So that's, that's a mystery on the C part. But it's a ball and socket that probably is one of the most unique things about this type of uh, particular type of sheet piling. And it, it's approved by the Corps of Engineers. We're in the specifications. Uh, we got that included back in 2010. And uh, if you look at this table, uh, you can see it's a Z shape. And it's almost the same analogy as a wide flange. You got the top and bottom, you have the flanges. In the middle, you have the web. And uh, typically, if you're a design engineer, you would be looking for the section modulus because you're resisting the bending moment. So you're really trying to get the bending moment capacity, which is really based on the elastic section modulus. So if you look at the numbering system, uh, there's no mystery to that either. Our, uh, the com our, com our competitors use the same type of numbering. Say if you look at the, the section PZC18, that 18 really just corresponds to the elastic section modulus. If you go across that horizontal line and you go to the metric in the red, you'll see 1800 centimeters cubed per meter. That is where they get the 18. It's really just an, it's a designation for the metric centimeters cubed per uh, meter. So that's all that, that's how you get the, uh, the section modulus. And as you can see, the that, that plays uh, very importantly into the bending moment capacity. Uh, we also have different grades. Uh, typically, you know, back in my day, I, I've probably given away my age, but the A36 was predominantly the steel uh, in use. Nowadays, uh, you know, grade 50 is probably the more common, but now it's almost grade 60. So it's almost probably cheaper to get grade 60 than it would even be to grade to get grade 50. Uh, so uh, that's something to keep in mind when your your specifications. I, I run across a lot of them that that are a little bit outdated, uh, and and you probably need to pay attention to those type of things. And then uh, we also provide an A690, and that is a, a Mariner steel. That's something that's good in the splash zone. And I, I have a another presentation. Uh, I think in the fourth quarter where I'll look at more at the um, uh, corrosion and I'll, I'll dive into that a little bit more, but it, for today, I'm not gonna touch too much on, on, on corrosion. So I mentioned the interlocks and there's many types out there. Uh, just real briefly, I'll just go around the circle on this slide. Uh, the, starting at the left middle, that's a flat sheet and it's a finger and thumb uh, type of interlock. That one would be used for um, tension structure. So that one is designed for tension. Uh, typically a ball and socket, which is that middle orange red interlock, that ball and socket really isn't designed for tension. It's just to hold the sheet wall together and they slide down uh, vertically and that's how they create this wall. But uh, I, I'll touch upon what are interlocks, which if you look at any catalog, whether it's ours or any mills catalogs, nobody mentions um, Z interlock strengths is just not mentioned. It's not shown, but I've tested a, a, a lot of different walls based on some project requirements, especially for seismic. And I can tell you that our ball and stock is probably one of the strongest in industry. I've got the test results that I've, I've shared with some folks uh, when we were collaborating, trying to get some, some projects approved. But uh, if you look at the top left one, that one is a Hoche interlock. That's a foreign interlock. And you could tell it's a little bit different, uh, uh, significantly different than the ball and socket. Then if you look at the top right, that one is also a foreign interlock. It's the Arcelor Metal Claw. Uh, and that, that is also a, a, a predominant interlock. Uh, if you look at the interlock on the bottom right, that one is totally different. That one is a cold form. I've mentioned we were talking earlier about hot rolled. Well, that's a cold form. If you notice, it's uniformly uh, thick all throughout. And if you can imagine, they get a coil. 
and, and, excuse me, and just like a, a paper clip, for instance, you, they just bend that interlock. And if you're, uh, I'll talk about this in a second, but if you're worried about getting water through this interlock, that's probably not the right interlock to specify. And uh, that's one of the advantages of the ball and socket. Uh, contractors like it because we also rent our interlock, uh, our, our sheet piling. And because we rent them, the contractor has to pull that sheet back out of the ground. And some of these other interlocks are pretty tight. Ours are very conducive to getting them in the ground easily and getting them out of the ground just as easy. Uh, for instance, another uh, great advantage of the PZC is you can actually flip it if you're, say, a contractor and you're driving a straight wall and you hit a boulder. You know, you can flip that sheet over and continue going on, on the line, on the wall line. Uh, another big advantage, which we we see a lot of, uh, is when, uh, say, you have an environmental project due to uh, some mitigation of some flow uh, contaminated water through some soil. You can actually lay this out in a, in a sawtooth configuration and that sawtooth gives you a little bit wider lay of the sheet pile and it'll and, and of course if you have an issue with water getting through it you can put a interlock sealant and that sealant should uh, re re prevent any uh, flow through that interlock completely. Just a Real briefly, I'm, I, I've got another presentation that really dives into coffer dams. I just wanted just to share with you probably more predominant use of sheet piling, uh, Z sheet piling. And uh, this is a coffer dam in Texas. It's right off of Lake Livingston, north of Houston. And this project is, is pretty much done. Uh, what I like to share about it is if you can see from the photo, it's Z sheets that are made in a circle, but if you think of coffer dams as, and you're the contractor or you're the design engineer, you're trying to get something built quickly. Notice there isn't any bracing. There's nothing in the way. There's no struts. Uh, this is give. This provides a really wide open uh, work area for the contractor. He can get equipment in there. He can really build uh, without having any issues. This is approximately 65 feet deep. And if you notice, there's concrete rings that are spaced approximately 10 feet. And just to give you an idea of how that design works is as you drive the sheets in a circle, this is a pretty big uh, diameter. I want to say it's probably almost 200 uh, feet diameter. And what they'll do is they'll drive the sheets. And then once you excavate for that first 10 feet, you lay right on the ground that formwork for that first ring. And that ring is approximately five feet wide, uh, three feet deep. And I, I would guesstimate that you're probably going to use maybe six number eight bars and you use some hangers to hold it uh, attached to the wall of the sheet piling. Now, if you're a smarter contractor, you would probably think about putting some strain gauges on your rebar. That way, uh, you would probably be using some high early concrete, so you're not going to wait the 28 days. Once you get your bar reinforcing, uh, uh, the strain gauge information from that, you'll know that you'll get the strength that you require. And maybe you only wait a few days and then you excavate the next 10 feet. And then you repeat the process and put another beam. And that's how you go all the way down. And it's just, I, I like this picture. It just shows a, just a big wide open area that, uh, you know, it provides a contractor. Uh, this is really probably a picture of a more common uh, use of a coffer dam. You'll see the Z sheets going around in a rectangular shape. You'll see that uh, there's what they call whalers, and those whalers are attached to the sheet, and they, they're the, what provides the support for the, uh, the walls. And then you'll also see some struts that go horizontally across the excavation. In this case, there's actually one, two, three levels of framework that uh, hold that sheet piling wall. Uh, one of the things I uh, provide and I can help and assist and collaborate with you is if you have a project, I have several analysis software. I, I help uh, all the time when if you have any need, I can analyze it any way you like. I have uh, several software packages, uh, DeepX, Pile, Pilebuck, SPW911, CivilSoft. Uh, if this is a Corps of Engineer job, uh, I, God forbid I even have a 
seawall sheet, which uh, can also do it. I, I say that only because the seawall sheet, the Corps of Engineers software, it doesn't give you the deflection, so you got to do a little bit of gymnastics to calculate the, the deflection, but it's still uh, it's still doable. And uh, also, I can help design it once I get that. What I tell contractors, and uh, I, I wish we were doing this live, but uh, when I talk to contractors, I always tell them, if you have a yard and you have material in your yard, I'm happy to assist you in designing those whalers and struts with the material you have. Doesn't make any sense to design something if you're going to have to go buy it if you have it already. So I, I'm happy to work with you in that respect. And uh, and 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 we we do it all the time. And then we also have a CAD department, so we actually will be able to draw this for you in AutoCAD. So it's a pretty uh, accurate drawing that you you can get. We're happy to help out. This is another coffer dam. This is more of a little story behind this one. This is some. This is a picture I took. This coffer dam is out in Minnesota, and this is like in the middle of winter, middle of December actually. And I remember getting on a barge, a bu ice busting barge. And uh, once we got to this excavation for a bridge pier, and, the, and like I said, in the middle of the Mississippi, uh, it's very cold. It's uh, uh, the reason I'm there <laughs> is the real question is because I get a call from a contractor and he's very upset. He's saying our sheets are no good and that there's problems and they're leaking. And sure enough, when I get to this site, I can see the icicles uh, forming on the inside. You can see that from, from this picture. And uh, you know, the first thing I asked the contractors, I asked him, I go, did you put sealant? And I'm, you know, I'm not trying to add salt to the wound, but but uh, of course he didn't do that. And you know, of course I'm out there now, I'm trying to help uh, try to solve this issue. And uh, you, some of the folks out in the audience will probably laugh at this, but there's some old timers that will tell you if you have a leaking coffer dam like this, what you can do is you can mix, uh, believe it or not, horse manure with some with some straw and you dump it outbound and it'll filter through the interlock and, and you could probably seal it up that way. Now, this is being on the Mississippi, the environmental folks, they said, no, you're not gonna do that. And so they, uh, we went, worked back, went back to them and worked with them. We ended up using seashell grind it up and added a I forget the number two sand to it and and that's what we dumped off bound and, and let that filter through to help seal up those uh, leaks the the moral of the story is and you can see that this is three level three levels of bracing there's two guys down there uh, you know that you got you got to keep pumps going 24 7 if, if you don't put a sealant and uh, you know the contractor this is getting close to Christmas he'd rather be home drinking hot toddies but he's over here babysitting a coffer dam. So if you have a project like this and you don't want to be that contractor out there, uh, talk to us. We got some good material. Uh, we got the interlock sealant. It's, uh, it's called steelant. It's a bituminous material. It's very robust. Uh, since we rent sheets to actually remove it, I've seen contractors actually have to use a torch just to get it off. It's really a, a good material that you can probably solve this kind of problem. So the bang. Uh, presentation is really this mechanically stabilized embankment, uh, MSE walls. And I just wanted to share with you some case studies. I think uh, we were really fortunate collaborating with some, some great uh, teams out there, uh, great contractor teams, great uh, consultant teams. And I think uh, some of these ideas you'll see uh, will really kind of hit home for, for some of us. Uh, I just, I had a CAD, uh, one of my CAD guys, he lives uh, up there in New Jersey and he sent me this photo. And this is um, Belmar, New Jersey. It's right there, uh, South Jersey. And, and this just happened. This is like uh, several days ago. Some of you may have already been impacted on the traffic, but this is on I-295 uh, Route 42. This was a big job, $900 million uh, job. If you look at that zoomed in circle, red circle there, you can see something doesn't look right. That wall has, has failed down at the base. Uh, not a good thing. Uh, one thing about this type of MSC wall, you see this all around the country. Uh, it doesn't matter where you're at. You, uh, I'm here in Atlanta on I-400. Uh, we they're doing a bunch of these walls. They're they're all over. They're very predominant. They're they are a concrete precast concrete panel that have straps that get layered uh, with soil that hold that face by use of the strap. So you can tell from this photo something must have happened. Uh, 
down in that area where the photo is, but it's not a, it's not a good thing. <laughs> this is not a good picture to show uh, on it, but this is just, uh, just something to share with you that these, you know, no walls are perfect and uh, this T-wall was not uh, a, good, a good day for the contractor. So the first project I'm going to talk about is a project that we worked and collaborated with uh, on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. This is a, right north of uh, Pittsburgh. And you can see this is already has some issues. This is a very steep incline. Uh, there's a steep incline on both sides of the, of, the, of, the, of the roadway. And you can see the failures already occurring. They, need to, they needed to come in here and repair that. Uh, very steep terrain. And uh, the original design was, was to use a T-wall, which wasn't surprising because that's what they use almost everywhere in the country. And, and you know, just so most of you probably have seen just by driving past this construction sites, when you do a T-wall, you need space. You need places to drive uh, cranes. You need places to store this these panels. They need to be stored nearby. You need to have ways to bring in truckloads in there. And even after you begin building it, it's like a tinker toy. This they they require uh, a lot of, uh, of, of 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 crane work to put them in the right position. And uh, this is very typical for for that T-wall retaining system. This is the way this uh, project was originally designed on the turnpike. And uh, we came back and uh, kind of the story behind this is probably a year before this project happened, I got a phone call from 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 a geotech and uh, Earth, Inc., Earth Inc. And he came back, he was trying to come up with some ideas. And of course we were trying to come up with a steel uh, idea. And I did uh, several analysis where I was trying to uh, show that we can just do that face wall just with the wall, but uh, because uh, this is the turnpike, they wanted to be, you know, extra, extra conservative. And so he came up with this idea of using what he called uh, fins, and it's almost like a uh, perpendicular wall coming away from that face wall. And uh, working with Earth Inc. and then the the the, the general contractor was Trumbull, uh, and of course the customer was uh, Pennsylvania Turnpike. This original uh, four to six lane widening, it was almost approximately, I'm going to say almost four miles. And uh, we came up with the 35 foot tall PZC 26 as the as a face. And then we have PZC 13s that came out as fins. And uh, it, it was a pretty nice design. And uh, I got some, some pictures here. The way it worked is, uh, here's a drawing on the left. And you can see the horizontal Z sheet wall. That is the face wall. Uh, that's where the the down slope of the of that embankment is. And uh, you can see that blow up in there. That is a uh, piece. Uh, it's a it's a connector that allows that vertical that shown in the picture vertically. Uh, it's that side wall that comes projects from that face wall. And you'll also notice that there's some smaller uh, fins thin walls, side walls, and those smaller walls were added after we did more analysis. And just because my analysis showed we could probably get away with not doing that, they, they the contract, the analysis and the consultant wanted to add the, those fins just for added to stability and support uh, because the, the analysis that uh, we did additional analysis uh, we're of a concern because of deflection. So uh, the photo, the picture on the right hand side is a profile and you can see it. Uh, you can see the roadway up on top. You can see the, the slope in that dotted, not dotted, but the dash line. And uh, the beauty of this is all this work is is being done from above. Here's a better picture of what I was trying to explain. So the uh, top right, you can see that uh, three-way ball and socket. Uh, you got the ball and socket interlocks and then you got that three-way connector. It's an extruded connector that uh, is attached there and that's what allows that fin wall to uh, project as a sidewall. And uh, you know, was, this is a very interesting project because as part of the uh, part of this was they put strain gauges. And I mentioned that our, our sheet piles, PZCs are very strong and uh, they were actually getting an average interlock strength of 14, almost 15 kips per inch. And uh, that's that falls pretty close to what my other test that I mentioned. And usually 
for Z sheets, I've always seen between 11 to 15 kips per inch. And this is just another great uh, example of, of, of what we were seeing out this out here at this project. And uh, and like I said, unfortunately, this isn't something that's published in any of manuals for any Z sheet manufacturer. But uh, the beauty is I have a bunch of tests that have worked out really great because uh, when somebody needed the strength, we were able to show. And I, and I was uh, in early on, I kept telling the the uh, Geotech that I, I had full confidence in our interlock strength. Uh, just because when you know 15 kips per inch is pretty uh, pretty amazing. As I mentioned, you know we I first did some analysis using you know Pilebuck, uh, uh, DeepX, and of course uh, this being the the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and they're they're just like the Corps of Engineers. They they want to make sure they want to be extra safe. This is something new. They've never done this, so they required us to uh, collaborate, and and we did a a finite element analysis. And again, the, the concern they were having was around midway up the wall, the height of the wall. They were seeing some deflection. I analyzed this finite element. And I thought it was a little bit conservative on the modeling, but uh, that that was okay. We, we were still able to, uh, even even after adding some additional concrete flow in there, we were still under budget. We were uh, really good on the budget wise, and it just amazes me that we even after adding those additional thin thin walls. We were still under budget, so it's a little added uh, strength, but I think uh, all in all, everybody felt very confident in this analysis. Uh, just some really uh, nice pictures you can see from the top left. That's You can get an idea how steep that embankment is. Now, if this was originally done as a T-wall, you can imagine they would have had to tear up that uh, that uh, that steep slope and to get roads built in there, you would have to have all kinds of fill bring in there. You probably have to build another wall just to, to handle the traffic. And with this system here, we didn't disturb anything down, down that slope. Um, if you look at uh, the top right, uh, it says steel uh, sheets pile wall construction. That's actually from the contractor, he took a video, and if you if you trumble, if you if you look at his uh, LinkedIn site, he has a video on this. Really nice. It shows a uh, shows these are some of the pictures from that. But the beauty of this, then the bottom pictures there, uh, we were able to install this wall from on top. You didn't have to get down below. You we were driving from the top, almost at the same elevation as the roadway. And if you look at that bottom left picture. You'll see I, there's one, two, three, four, four people there, four construction workers. Uh, there's also a truck that brings the material. So you got five guys. I took that picture. This was, again, middle of winter. And that day that I took this picture, it snowed 10 inches. And when I usually present to contractors, I, I, I notice that they get interested because I'm, you know, if you can keep production going in 10 inches of snow uh, with a five-man crew and you can keep going on this, this is really uh, a big uh, savings and schedule. Now we didn't bid anything on schedule. There's no money. It's a money saver on the bid that we when we won this job. But if you put the number on the schedule on the savings of time, time is such an important factor. And uh, you know, collaborating, uh, it's it's great to be able to to say we were part of this because we saved the contractor. You know, get this out of the critical path. Uh, it was just a great. Uh, a great project. This was actually a award winning project for uh, ACEC and they're in Pennsylvania. Uh, again, you know, for material savings of when you can say you can save almost half a million dollars and 6% uh, of the project, I think uh, the turnpike uh, kind of got their attention. But the big savings, I think in my mind, is you can, you can go back to the contractor and say you're going to save 50% of the time, in this case, six months. This is a huge savings for a contractor. Time is money. That's that's really where we need to be looking at in, in terms of savings. Uh, I think this is just an all around uh, great example of how uh, you know you can collaborate and come up with a great idea. What was even nicer about this job is uh, Earth Inc. Uh, as I mentioned, when I was working with them very early on. They actually went out and got a patent on this. So I, I say patent pending, but it actually, as of today, they they actually received the patent already, and it's just it's just nice to be able to work on on a project where you you know they they're actually able to get a patent on it. I'm happy to help out in in any way, and uh, 
you can see from the top photo, you can see some of the sketches on the patent and then some and then some other side elevation photos of how that concrete flow look went in there to just help it uh, on some of the displacements. But uh, this was just an all around uh, great project. Even after it was done, uh, there's some homes, very nice homes on the other side of that valley. And they, they say they like the way it looks. It has a great look. Uh, you can see from the top photo, uh, notice nothing is disturbed. Uh, the, the vegetation is still intact. Uh, it's just a really nice clean project. The bottom picture shows some, some completion pictures. Uh, this there's no coating on this. This is just natural patina of the of the sheet piling. So it's just a, it would turned out to just be a really great alternative uh, that was great working with the with Earth Inc and a great team with Trumbull there and the pile drivers. It was a all around uh, great team teamwork on it. So I'm going to flip stations now, and I've been talking about bending moment capacity section modulus. Well. Now, when I talk about flat sheets, there is no section modulus. If you look at this table for our PS sheets, you'll see that under section modulus, there is no section modulus. It's uh, three, you know, 3.2 inches cubed, 1.9 inches cubed per foot. There is no section modulus. And the way they uh, use these flat sheets, they, they're put in a circle and it's a cellular structure. And once you, you interlock these in a circle, you fill that interior out with some good uh, uh, free draining uh, material, earth material in there, granular material. Uh, typical project may be something like this Port of San Diego, uh, starting from the right hand side. Uh, you see a dredger over there and then you see the templates, they get floated out to position. They have what they call spuds that get them into that right position. And then you have a series of sheets, flat sheets that are attached uh, using that template as a guide in a circle. And then from that main circle, you have these interconnecting arcs that come and they're attached in specific locations. That has to be all detailed correctly. And then you connect the next full circle. And as you can see from the left-hand side, now you can, once you pump out the water, you fill that with some good uh, granular material. Here's another project uh, also in San Diego. This is a, a water pump house, and you got to imagine they put in these cellular structures. Uh, these have been around since the 30s. Uh, the Corps of Engineers has been putting in cellular structures uh, up and down the Mississippi, Missouri, Ohio rivers. Uh, you know, when you get out in deeper water, you just can't make a, a regular Z sheet pile wall work. You know, and, and, and probably I, I didn't touch on it, but even combination walls, you're just getting too much uh, loading. And in this case, a cellular may be the, the option. And to me, I, I love to just show this because you can see a crane that works on top of that in the photo there. It becomes a working platform. And the reason they're doing this is you're putting some pipe work into that water to get deeper and deeper into that water. And uh, sometimes you've got to build a, a structure and this is a temporary structure. Here's another example. This is also a temporary structure. It's a flat web sheet piling at Seabrook. This is uh, in Louisiana. You can see there's two walls. There's a higher wall and a lower wall. This is not too many of these uh, type that, that I've seen, you know, where there's two right next to each other. What's amazing about this, as I mentioned earlier, that you, you have to almost build that. And you can see the cranes that are working on top of the walls. It becomes a, a good method to keep a, a working platform. They're very good in, in taking that that loading. They, they're very good in loading. They're very good. It's a mass system. It, it depends on just uh, sitting on top of some good, good uh, soil. But uh, they build that to, they do that to build this. Uh, and, and this is the final, uh, what the final structure looks like. Uh, so it, it's amazing to me that they, they use those structures as a temporary. They come back and they pull it out. And uh, that, that's just amazing for that. Uh, another project I mentioned earlier is we were really fortunate. LB Foster was awarded a, a pretty good job over there at the Panama Canal. Uh, it was a, a expansion, a portion of the expansion there where we were involved with the Barinkin Dam. Uh, we provided over a mile of coffer dam for this, uh, for this cellular structure. And it was just a great opportunity to work with the ACP. They're kind of like the Corps of Engineers in Panama. Uh, this isn't a US project. This is a foreign job. We used 
uh, uh, all domestic material. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we provided uh, a lot of assistance on the design and, and engineering. These are all uh, cellular structures. They're, they're, they, they range in like 71 feet diameter. There was a couple of different sizes. Uh, the, the length of the sheets were something in the neighborhood of 68 feet long. And uh, this is just a great, uh, a great job for us. And when we when we got out there, we the first thing, you know, once you get uh, the template in there, you can see the spuds that are sticking out. Once you stab them in the right configuration, then uh, you've got to have those uh, flat sheets that go around it that uh, use that template to form that circle. And there's a whole art to this. I, I, I have another presentation. I'll talk about this more in depth. And uh, this is just kind of a really quick, uh, just to show you what, what a cellular structure looks like. And uh, in this case, when we did the Panama Canal, they actually built this mile of, uh, of uh, cellular structure. We, there was two teams. One team was a, a Panamanian uh, team, Iconsa. Great uh, partner. We collaborated with them. That's how we kind of got... Uh, we found out about this job. We were really grateful. We also teamed up with the Gettle out of Ohio, another great partner. They are very familiar with flat sheets. They know how to do it. They brought all their material and, and barged it over, even uh, uh, even their equipment. Uh, so they brought their templates. Everything was barged over. And even, those, even with that kind of uh, challenges, they were actually able to finish a mile and I, and I want to guess it was like uh, under four months, maybe maybe four or five months of time, which is pretty amazing in a foreign country, building out in, in water. You can see they're putting a tremi concrete on down below to seal it. They after you do after you put that, you pump the water out, and you can see the interconnecting arcs in this picture. And then then once you pump it out, then you put the granular material. Uh, one of the fun things about this project, as an engineer anyway, is is uh, we weren't we weren't paid until we were able to deliver uh, 17,000 tons, and that's what that picture shows. And that is 17,000 tons, and uh, that they're stacked up in 10 foot high rows, and they we had to stack them up so that a contractor, which hadn't been awarded yet, could get access anywhere around it. And uh, uh, it was just a, a fascinating project. A little side story there is. Uh, we had to deliver from Houston down to MIT after we had to get special uh, dunnage because of them. They didn't want their our bugs to go contaminate. They have very lucrative uh, hardwood forest in Panama. Uh, besides doing all the welding, we, you know, you, you got to imagine taking the material from our uh, mill, get it on rail cars, get it down to Houston, weld the connectors to it, get it on ocean. Uh, ships. It took five ships to get it over to Panama, MIT terminal, and from there we had to offload it onto the the Roro yard, which uh, they were upset because we can you imagine this much steel taking up room in your Roro yard, and then uh, put them on over 900 trucks to get it to this job site before we got paid. Uh, it was just a challenge uh, all all the way around, but uh, great experience. Uh, so another method, um, this is uh, more tools for your toolbox. This is another uh, method it's called open cell, and this is also a flat sheet and it's a cellular structure, but it's not a full round cell. This is almost like a half uh, circle. And PND engineers, they were also able to patent this design. It's very innovative. And, and, and since it uses only a half circle and it, used, it also uses sidewalls to hold that, that front scalloped wall, uh, it's very economical. It's another very economical solution. And uh, we work with PND. We can actually with, provide you, if, you, if we get at least a geotech report, some basic information, if you even have an AutoCAD uh, plan view or even a section view, uh, PND and, and, and LB Foster will be happy to come up with a white paper and almost give you a cost before you have to spend a penny. And we've been working with PND, oh gosh, almost going on 30 years now. And uh, this is something we can do and help uh, out. We're happy to help out in any way. Uh, again, this is another MSE wall, and it uh, uses that horizontally tied membrane. And uh, and again, you don't have to drive these sheets 
down like a Z wall. This just gets up to some good soil bearing. That's as far as you got need to go. Unless, you know, you want to get down below the, the dredge and make sure there's no water infiltration. You might go a little bit more. The Europeans like to go like uh, three, three, four, five meters deeper. Um, but this, you can see from the picture on the right, the front wall, which is that scalloped, and then you have the side walls that, that provide holding that. And again, once you know your global stability criteria, uh, that's, that's what PND will help in getting the final design on how long the sheets are, uh, how long the wall is, and, and we can provide pricing for you. This is a, another great example of uh, nowadays, you know, there's a lot of uh, environmental mitigation projects. This is in Alameda Point, California. Uh, this is right in the Bay Area. This is on the Bay. Uh, what happened, that, this is an old submarine yard, and uh, apparently there were some issues with some contamination. Um, they were going to have to excavate all this contaminated soil and dispose of it very costly. Uh, there is another solution. Uh, encapsulation is an approved solution. So working with the uh, the Corps of Engineers, we were able to, working with PND, we were able to come up with a solution using a uh, open cell. And in this case, uh, we use galvanized sheets. And these galvanized sheets are driven in, and then they they capsulize that contamination after removing that top, the top contaminated uh, layers. So it's another really good viable solution. Um, this is kind of an out of the box uh, solution that you really don't see. That's also a, this was a brownfield out of New York City uh, there in Long Island and uh, Glen Isle Waterfront Development and working with the developer in this case, which is for, for an engineer, this is another great opportunity. We don't work with the developers too often, but this is a great opportunity working with the developer. He had a great idea for a site, a lot of condominiums, a, lot, a whole lifestyle kind of uh, community. Uh, called Garvey's Point, and we were able to work with uh, the engineer on this one, AAE and and uh, PND, and we were able to come up with a really good viable solution for this for this development site. And uh, Pasilico was the contractor, worked with him, and there's uh, probably several phases to this, but this first phase, you can see uh, how much of parks and areas that they were uh, providing in this, what would have been a brownfield, uh, so this is just another example of of how you know collaboration really can can be beneficial as a as an economical solution. And on economical solution, here's a, a great case study of a project. This is called Owensboro and Riverwall. This is right off the Mississippi and uh, uh, city of Owensboro. And again, working with the contractor Richard Gettle. He's familiar. He's also did, as I mentioned, the, helped us with the Panama Canal. Uh, he knows about flat sheets. He's very knowledgeable. Uh, he came to the, uh, this was originally designed as a combination wall tie back. And he went back, we went, worked with PND. And when you can go back to the owner and say, we're going to save you $11 million by using an open cell, which was 22%. I believe that's it may be a little bit more than that. 22% of the whole price. It kind of gets people's attention. And uh, again, you know, just another collaboration where, where I think uh, they even uh, were able to put a, a concrete cladding there. You can see in the middle picture. I don't know. I, I Even from the bottom photo, I think it looks nice the way it, without the cladding, but they had so much uh, money left over. They were, this is a city park, so they wanted to make it look nice, dress it up nice. But this is just a great uh, example of a, of, a, of a collaborative job, you know, working with Gettle and PND that can save some pretty amazing savings. And again, we give a white paper, you can almost go back to the customer and show them that they're going to have this kind of a cost with the savings before you even have to, you know, hire PND as your consultant. Uh, I, I don't have a slide uh, for another project we just completed with PND uh, just recently. As I just, I was just out the job site um, last week in uh, in in Sabine Pass in Louisiana, right on the border with Texas, and we just completed a job there with Bechtel. Uh, I, I hope to get some photos. Bechtel has to approve it with Chenier. So once we get approval, I'll, I'll share with everybody that on the next uh, uh, next webinar. But uh, that was just another 
project. Uh, we've been doing open sales all up and down the Gulf uh, Mississippi rivers. Uh, it's a really viable solution. And I, again, if you have a project, it doesn't hurt to, to see if there's a, you know, something we can do with an open cell. So this is my contact information. Uh, again, if you have any questions, uh, email me and I'm happy to, uh, you know, I'll, I'll respond to all your questions. I have no problem uh, emailing you back. Just uh, send me that. I'd be happy to do that. Um, and I'm going to try to see if I can do the uh, the question and answer portion next. And if you have any questions, uh, please type it in there on the Q&A and I will try to uh, answer you. And again, if there's uh, any questions you think after, I'm happy to answer afterward as well. Uh, there was one question, uh, are there any difficulties in extracting the sheets post excavation if a sealant is used? Uh, we've, we've used uh, sealant, uh, typically it's used on, on many projects such as a coffer dam, for instance, where, yeah, you drive them in, you still have to take them out. And I, I started sharing that um, story where after they take the sheets off, the ball and socket uh, contractors really like that interlock because it it just gives them so much leeway. You got 10 degrees of play in the interlock. So that's really a benefit. And when they take it out, it, it's easier to take out. It's not a tight interlock. You, you can get it out, but with that sealant, it'll stop the flow. But when you start taking it out, the heat generated will let you pull it out. As I mentioned, the, the, the tough part about it is the uh, cleaning it out. If you rent that sheet, you always, you have to clean it. So uh, I've seen contractors have to use a torch and I mean, they have to put that torch and you have to clean it out and you have to return it back to the clean, uh, as clean as it was when it was sent out to you to your job site. So yeah, there, there shouldn't be any difficulties in extracting. We That's something that's done all the time. Uh, so there's no problem with that. And I trying to see if there's any more questions, but any uh, questions, as I mentioned, uh, we're coming up. I think we got, we're doing good on time, but uh, I wanted to leave some time. If anybody thinks of one later, uh, I'm happy to, to stay around and, and answer any questions if you think of them. Uh, again, I really want to thank you very much. As I mentioned, email me any, any questions you have later. Uh, we are going to have, uh, LB Foster is going to have another series uh, next quarter and uh, be happy to talk, uh, have you join us and, and see if there's anything of interest there. I'll share with you some good uh, collaborative uh, case studies as well. Uh, the next series I think is going to be, uh, one is next quarter I think is combination walls. As I mentioned, we got one on corrosion. Uh, I'll talk about, um, and then also cellular structures. So there's so there's three more. I'll dive a deeper into the cellular structures. I touched a little bit upon it. As I mentioned, uh, uh, we we're happy to work with you. Uh, I think uh, as an engineer, it's always great to work and collaborate with, with, with engineers and contractors. You know, there's so much design build going on uh, that uh, it's, it's pretty kind of commonplace. Uh, on the uh, corrosion, that whole seminar I'm going to be uh, providing on that. I'll dig in deeper on different types of corrosion and how you can mitigate those. Uh, so we'll be happy to uh, uh, hopefully see you on that next uh, webinar. And um, I see, uh, let me see. I think there's another question. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Satish. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm definitely looking forward to the next webinar and uh, also hoping that you'll be able to join us. If I wanted to mention, you know, <laughs> we're living in this COVID life and, uh, you know, this is what uh, brings this uh, webinar into being, but uh, post COVID, I'm, I've, I've got my shots. Hopefully I'll be uh, traveling more. I've already been out to the job sites, but if you have a need where you want to bring a presentation to your team in a live situation, I'm happy to go live with you and uh, we'll meet your team. We'll specify the presentation exactly 
to your needs, to what you want to cover. And uh, heck, we'll even uh, provide a box lunch. Uh, we're happy to do that. The sales person for that area will go in there. If uh, if it's a particular presentation, uh, PND is happy to join as well. And uh, we can dive in if there's a, a specific project you guys want to talk about. But we do that all the time uh, from coast to coast. I, uh, I've done those. Uh, been doing them uh, for for the last uh, 14 years with LB Foster, so be happy to do that with you guys. Uh, no no problem. So anything that comes up like that, let me know. Uh, be happy to do that. I don't see any more questions, but like I said, if there are any others, just uh, I please don't hesitate. I'm happy to answer and. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stick on for just a little bit uh, in case somebody thinks of something, but I want to thank everybody uh, for your time uh, in joining us. And, um, and hopefully we can get together live. Uh, uh, my schedule is getting better. I, I'm starting to travel. I think I go to Idaho next week. After that, I go to Dallas. If some of you are going to the IFC, uh, I'll be at IFC as well. LB Foster will have a, will have a booth there. So please stop in our booth. Uh, if there's something that you forgot to ask, uh, we'll we'll have our booth there. We'll have information. Uh, be happy to to spend time with you at that uh, IFSI. I don't see any more questions coming in, but I'll also uh, like to tell you that uh, as soon as we end this, uh, we'll be sending you your PDH uh, certificate of attendance. And uh, you should get that via email and um, uh, any again. Uh, I think this is I, I got I, I'm thinking this is recorded, but I wasn't sure when we first set it up. This is uh, uh, I'm not sure if the IT folks clicked on the recording. So if it is recorded, uh, we'll probably allow uh, you guys to get a copy of the recording in case you know, some of us multitask and we can go back and, and listen at your leisure, but um, we'll, we'll definitely share that as well. I don't see any more questions. So at this point, uh, again, I want to thank everybody. Uh, and if, as I mentioned, please uh, let me know if you have any questions and uh, glad to uh, glad to help out and hope to see you out on the, uh, at your site or at your office or even in a webinar. Thank you very much, everybody.